नमो भगवते नरसिंहाय नमस्ते जस तेजसे आवीर आवीर भव वज्र नक्क वज्रतमश्र कर्माशयांदय रंदय तमो ग्रस ग्रस ओ स्वाहा अभय अभय आत्मनि भूयिष्ठा ओ श्रौ ओ श्रौ ओ श्रौ सो um we want to wish all devotees in minneapolis yatra as well as all the devotees who are joining us today i believe there are devotees who are coming from uh, canada and uh, there may be some devotees around the world also we wish all of them a blissful appearance day of lord narsingh dev in singapore it was yesterday i think it's evening there for you in the us uh, we had a wonderful program here too we had uh, we had nice abhishek of lord narsingh dev one of the devotees in singapore uh, his grace sudarshan prabhu has a beautiful deity of lord narsingh dev so we did an online uh, narsingh dev abhishek and then we heard a class and we had kirtan and i was so happy to hear the children singing just now because they are the future of krishna consciousness and it's not an accident but krishna's arrangement the children are so attracted to lord narsingh dev actually you find that around the world when you read the past time of lord narsingh dev actually frankly to a materialist who has no understanding of spiritual life it sounds very violent but you will find that very often devotees you know especially children they love to sit down and see narsingh dev's drama and they become ecstatic when narsingh dev is killing hiranyakashipu <laughs> and that's the amazing thing i've never seen a child afraid of lord narsingh dev's form and that shows you the lord narsingh dev is truly the supreme personality of god so we started today's program by stating a nice invocation of prayer and that prayer that we sang just now is from is from the fifth canto 18th chapter 8th verse it's a very important prayer actually and it is stated actually it is sung by prahlad maharaj himself sometimes we wonder how come prahlad maharaj is singing in the fifth canto when all his past time is in the seventh canto because in this particular chapter prahlad maharaj together with the residents you know from jambudweep they are offering prayers to many many different forms of the lord and this particular prayer is offered to lord narsingh dev the meaning of the prayer is very important for us to invoke because prahlad maharaj says that i offer my respectful obeisances unto lord narsingh he is the source of all power this is very important for us to understand on the appearance day of lord narsingh dev Lord Narsingh Dev is the source of all power that we have just like non differently Krishna is the source of all sources in this world then Prahlad Maharaj goes on to say my lord you possess nails and teeth just like thunderbolts kindly vanquish our demon like desires for fruitive activity in this material world so this is actually the foundation of our prayer today for Narsingh Dev's appearance even though hiranyakashipu was killed by lord narsingh dev you realize in this prayer um prahlad maharaj does not make any reference to his father being killed because he is looking into the deeper meaning of the appearance of the lord the appearance of the lord was not just to kill hiranyakashipu and protect his devotee but as prahlad maharaj says here he is praying that this same form of the lord what should the lord what should be our prayer to krishna in the form of narsingh dev our prayer should be the lord narsingh dev you kindly vanquish destroy whatever demon like desires that we have and what are these desires desires that are considered demonic are desires where we want to enjoy separately from krishna so whatever fruitive activity that we perform in this world when we are looking for the results of that activity and we want to enjoy that result separately from krishna that is considered a demon like desire very important point 
And that was what defined Hiranyakashipu's life. For his entire life, he and his brother Hiranyaksha, they'd lived their lives completely separate from Krishna. They did not want to share anything they had or even offer it to Krishna. And sometimes as devotees, we take that so much for granted. We should understand that even when we come to the platform of devotional service, we should not think that because I'm rendering some service to Krishna, there must be some fruitive result coming from that devotional activity. That is the difference between a great devotee like Prahlad Maharaj and struggling devotees. Because struggling devotees bring the baggage of material fruitive consciousness into devotional service. And when we do that, then actually the demon-like desires in our heart are not fully vanquished. They are still in our hearts, but they assume different forms under the guise of devotional service. And that is why sometimes even when we perform devotional service, we are so disturbed. And this is what Prahlad Maharaj as a young boy was trying to explain to his father just before Lord Nasingadev appears from the pillar. So this verse is so important for us to start with. Because let that be our prayer today. And let that be our prayer every time we see Lord Nasingadev. That Lord Nasingadev, please vanquish the demon-like desire for fruitive activity in this material world. And then Prahlad Maharaj goes on in the prayer to say, please appear in our hearts. This is what he wants. He wants Krishna, Lord Nasingadev, to appear in our hearts. So until Krishna takes a seat in our heart, it is very hard for our heart to be purified. So we want Nasingadev to be seated in our hearts. And therefore, we have to remove all the clutter of materialistic furniture that is found in our heart. You know? If your house has so much of clutter, where will your guests sit comfortably? So where is that space for Krishna to be seated in our heart? If our heart is full of the clutter of material activities and our desire for the fruitive results of that activity. So Prahlad Maharaj says, you please appear in our hearts and you drive away our ignorance by your causeless mercy. This is a very important point. Please drive away our ignorance. On our own Prabhus and Matajis, it is very difficult actually for us to, to drive away all our problems. Very important point. Uh, it's very hard to drive away our ignorance on our, by ourselves. Hiranyakashipu thought he could do anything on his own, but he didn't realize that without Krishna, he can't do anything actually. So that's why in this prayer, it's so nicely stated, please appear in our hearts and drive away our ignorance so that by your mercy, now this is very important point, what is it that we want to achieve in devotional service? We pray to Lord Narsingha Dev, as Prahlad Maharaj says in this verse, let us become fearless in the struggle for existence. Very important. Let us become fearless in the struggle for existence in this material world. So Prabhupada in this purport says very nicely that unless one is completely free from material desires, which are caused by ignorance, one cannot fully engage in the devotional service of the Lord. Please, we should remember this point. The desire for material uh, things will always be an impediment between us and devotional service for Krishna. And therefore, Prabhu, Prabhupada says towards the end of the purport, we should always offer our prayers to Lord Narsingadev. Why? Because he killed Hiranyakashipu, who is the personification of material desire. Hiranya means gold, and Kashipu means soft cushion or bed. So between gold and soft cushion or bed, material persons always desire to make their body comfortable. And Prabhupada says, just to make your body comfortable, huge amounts of gold is required. Therefore, Hiranyakashipu. And therefore, Prabhupada says in the purport, Hiranyakashipu was the perfect representative of materialistic life. So when we talk about demon, it doesn't mean, you know, something very evil far away. No. Demonic tendency simply means that we become so materialistic that we forget who is the source of all our achievements. We forget that our demon-like desires become an impediment between us and Krishna. And we forget that this, the root of demon-like desires is our taste for fruitive activities. And therefore, Prabhupada says, those who have these desires, they become a cause of great disturbance. 
just like Hiranyakashipu became a cause of great disturbance to who? To Prahlad Maharaj. Until Hiranyakashipu was killed by Lord Narsingadev. So Prabhupada ends the purport very nicely. Any devotee aspiring to be free of material desires should offer his respectful prayers to Lord Narsingadev as Prahlad Maharaj did in this verse. So don't forget this verse. Uh, it is 5188. And my humble recommendation to everyone is daily we should chant this verse. When we see Lord Narsingadev, we should chant this verse. And we should remember and study this purport of Prabhupada very, very nicely. Lord Narsingadev is considered one of the great incarnations of Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he came to vanquish Hiranyakashipu. But that statement is not entirely true. Because very often, uh, for those who look in on the avatars of Krishna, we always have this idea in our hearts and heads that Krishna came and descended into this world as avatars for the specific reason to check the atheistic temperament of the demonic people. That is one function of an incarnation of the Lord. But Prabhupada states very nicely in the fourth chapter, seven and eight verses of Bhagavad Gita, that even though whenever there is a decline in religious practice, Krishna comes, but actually he does not come only to check the atheistic advances of the demons. Prabhupada writes, you know, in famous purports of the verses like, Yada yada hi dharmasya, glani bhavati bharata, abhyutthanama dharmasya tadat manam swajami aham. In that particular verse of 4.7 of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, Prabhupada makes it very clear that the whole purpose of the mission of incarnations is to arouse Krishna consciousness everywhere. And such consciousness is manifest and non-manifest only under different circumstances. So please, we should be very clear. Krishna doesn't come just to kill the demon. That's always a byproduct. But when the Lord descends, he descends to give courage in all of us so that our mood of Krishna consciousness is aroused. That's the whole purpose why Krishna comes. And then in 4.8 of Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya cha duskritam dharma samstapana tarya sambhavami yuge yuge. When you have time, look at the purport carefully of what Srila Prabhupada says. Because Srila Prabhupada says very nicely that actually Lord Krishna appeared primarily, he used the word primarily, to deliver Devaki rather than to kill Kamsa. Very nice point. The main aim why he came is to deliver Devaki rather than to kill Kamsa. This is very important. As we were saying, the important point to understand about the incarnation of the Lord is that he always comes primarily to deliver the devotees rather than to kill the demons. Just like Krishna came to deliver Devaki rather than to kill Kamsa. Even though Prabhupada says both were performed simultaneously. This is important because if Krishna came only to, for the purposes of killing demons, then I think, you know, the demon seems to be more important than the devotee. And we should remember that that is not true. The demons are byproducts. They may come to harass the devotees, but the Lord's eyes, his heart is always with the devotee. So this is a very important point we should remember. Krishna is so kind that he only comes to relieve the distresses of his devotees. He does not come to do anything else. And we should always be encouraged that just like Krishna was looking out for Prahlad Maharaj, Krishna is always looking out for us. And Lord Nasingadev, being that incarnation of the Lord that destroys materialistic tendencies in us, he is specifically looking out for us. That's why Srila Prabhupada introduced Narsingadev worship into ISKCON. He could have introduced the worship of any other avatar into ISKCON. But he specifically introduced Narsingadev because of this very important principle. Very important principle. Lord Narsingadev's pastime is a very long pastime in the sense that you have Hiranyakashipu praying to Lord Brahma initially because he wanted to become immortal. And if you remember, 
Brahmaji actually came after great austerities by Hiranyakashipu. And why did Hiranyakashipu do the austerities? Because if you remember, Hiranyaksha, his brother, was killed by the Lord in the form of Varaha. Now, Hiranya, Hiranyaksha was not an innocent man. He was a demon. And he was bent on destroying this world. And that is why the Lord came as Varaha. Not only did he come to check the atheistic temperament of Hiranyaksha and save the devotees, but specifically, he came to save Bhumi Devi because Hiranyaksha caused such great disturbance that, he, that Bhumi Devi's orbit was disturbed and she fell into the milk ocean and she stayed down at the bottom of the ocean in a very distressed condition of life. And when the Lord saw that this terrible demon had performed such a heinous act against his great devotee, Bhumi Devi, the Lord took the form of the great avatar, Varaha, and he very, very easily killed Hiranyaksha. Prabhupada says that the demonic tendency is, whenever we see that we are envious of Krishna, like Hiranyaksha was, and when Hiranyaksha's brother Hiranyakashipu saw that Hiranyaksha had died at the hands of Lord Vishnu, instead of coming to our senses and repenting, and understanding that what my brother did was wrong, Hiranyakashipu also having that same kind of association that he had with Hiranyaksha, he also had the envious mentality. And because of his envious mentality, he became revengeful and he plotted a revenge against Lord Vishnu. And so because of greed, desire to enjoy unlimited sense gratification, in Hiranyakashipu, decided to pray for great, great, great powers. And when finally Lord Brahma actually comes before him, uh, he asked for many, many boons. Now he knew that Lord Brahma was actually the secondary creator of the material universe. He should have asked Lord Vishnu or Krishna for all the boons. But when you're envious of someone, you never recognize their position and you will never turn to them for guidance and advice because your envy, you know, stops you from doing that. If only he had turned to, uh, to, to the Lord, Lord, uh, Lord Krishna is always ready to make any devotee more glorious than himself. And yet Hiranyakashipu did not turn to the source of all sources. So he turned to Brahma and he asked for many boons. One of his boons was that he should not meet death at the hands of any living entities created by Brahma. He thought that would probably be what we call in law an all-covering clause. Whatever that is born out of Brahma cannot touch me. That's as good as it can get. Then he said that even then, just to be sure, make sure that I cannot die within my residence or outside my residence. Let me also, let me also make sure that I should not die during daytime or night. Let me also make sure that I should not die on the ground or in the sky. Make sure that my death cannot be brought about by anyone created by you, nor by any weapon, nor by any human being, nor by any animal. Uh, Hiranyakashipu would have made a good lawyer because he covered everything possible. Then he said further, make sure that my death cannot come from any entity, living or non-living. Make sure that no demigod or demon or any great snake can kill me. Make sure that no one can kill me in the battlefield. And therefore, these were the boons that he asked. And Lord Brahma said, even though I cannot give you immortality, because I myself am not immortal, still, because you have asked me for all this and I'm very pleased by austerity, so be it. And therefore, with these boons, Hiranyakashipu thought that he was untouchable. And therefore, he terrorized the universe as the first original terrorist, as we say. And he was so powerful, Bhagavatam tells us, that if he lifted one eyebrow up, you know, uh, just like that, when he lifted it up, all the devatas would tremble. And when he lifted the other eyebrow up, whatever, whoever wives of the devatas, you know, if they were pregnant, they had miscarriages. That was how powerful actually uh, Hiranyakashipu was. 
and therefore he brought swarga loka under his control he brought the world under his control and there was no point of this world where hiranyakashipu was not powerful but still one person eluded him and that was his arch enemy shri vishnu and he was hoping he was hoping at some point of time that being so powerful he would never have to face krishna but there was one other person who gave him so much trouble and of all persons it was the member of his own family and it was his son pralad pralad maharaj was born in the womb of his mother kayadu but bhagavatam tells us he was not an ordinary child because even though he was born in the womb of a demon and his seed was that of hiranyakashipu do not forget that at the time when hiranyakashipu was gone away for austerities the devatas thought that they should kill pralad maharaj in the womb because if hiranyakashipu was such a terrible snake then the child of the snake so to speak in bhagavatam must be also killed so they came actually in the dark of the night when hiranyakashipu was not in his palace and the plan was to kidnap kayadu and kill the child when kayadu was about to be taken mercilessly by indra and the devatas bhagavatam tells us that narada muni intervened and when narada muni intervened he said let me take her and let me take this unborn child to my ashram and there i assure you that they will not be a cause of disturbance to anyone now this is an interesting point because while the devatas were afraid of the demons the devatas were also the devatas were also afraid that swarga loka would never be there as again so indirectly the devatas were anxious to go back to swarga loka as pure as uh, they were different from what we call the pure devotees of the lord because they had a motive to go back to swarga loka so narada muni is in a different category he is a pure devotee of the lord so he decided that the best way to end hiranyakashipu's reign is actually to inject devotional service into this matter and this is a very important lesson to all of us prabhus and mataji's we should remember that when we have problems in our life and when there appears to be demonic elements in our hearts as well as surrounding us there is only one solution to it don't do the materialistic solution kill this and i'll hate that eliminate this it doesn't work but actually we should follow what narada muni did narada muni interfered at the right point of time to save kayadu because he believed that he he chanted and prayed to the lord and chanted bhagavatam that unborn child would be a great great devotee of the lord and that is how devotional service actually resolves all issues and discrepancies in this world because of an intervention of a pure devotee and the wisdom of a pure devotee we can see how eventually hiranyakashipu's demonic reign was finished the devatas were restored to swarga loka lord nasinga dev appeared to protect his devotee and pralad maharaj became a devotee because of his spiritual master why because narada muni simply used the power of bhagavatam to resolve this entire issue so actually the solution of all solutions in this world is just to take supreme shelter of shrimad bhagavatam when we take shelter of shrimad bhagavatam all the avatars of the lord are ready always to protect us and that definitely includes lord nasinga dev so in that way kayadu and pralad maharaj as an unborn child they were actually brought to the ashram of narada muni away from the materialistic uh, atmosphere you know of hiranyakashipu's palace and there every day every day narada muni spoke bhagavatam to pralad maharaj and that is why pralad maharaj as an unborn child became one of the greatest devotees the world has ever known and kayadu being the mother she was actually the vessel a very very wonderful mercy of the mother is to provide the opportunity for a child to hear bhagavatam and that is what she did so we should not forget you know that being a kind mother she actually protected her child in the womb and she did the best thing she followed narada muni and she gave her child the opportunity to hear bhagavatam that's why all parents should be respected especially when they give children bhagavatam because by giving them bhagavatam 
actually they are allowing Lord Nasinga Dev to enter into their children's lives also. This is a very important point. So then Prahlad Maharaj, as he grew up, what happened? Instead of becoming the best demonic son of Hiranyakashipu, he became actually just the opposite. He, by the power of his association, he influenced all his classmates. If you remember, uh, Shanda and Anarka, you know, the two um, sons of Sukracharya who were tasked by Hiranyakashipu to teach uh, Prahlad Maharaj and all the other boys the demonic uh, signs, you know, of glorifying Hiranyakashipu. Instead of that, Prahlad Maharaj took over the class. And when the two uh, brothers, you know, were away, he completely transformed his classmates into Krishna conscious devotees. And if you see some pictures in Bhagavatam, you realize that they were doing nice kirtan together, actually. If, if, if Krishna consciousness can penetrate the house of Hiranyakashipu, then why can't it penetrate our hearts and our residences? If Krishna consciousness could actually start and flourish in the palace of Hiranyakashipu, then we should have full faith it can happen even in our house. Imagine under the very nose of Hiranyakashipu, there was Kirtan going on in his palace. Amazing. Why? Because Prahlad Maharaj heard from Narada Muni and he simply repeated what he learned in the womb without any deviation. And that is why he is dear to Lord Nasimhadev. Because whatever that he heard, he presented as it is. And that is the potency of Prahlad Maharaj. And that is the potency of being within the parampara of Krishna consciousness. So now we realize that when, when, um, when, when, the two, um, when the two sons of Sukracharya became very upset because they presented, uh, they presented uh, Prahlad Maharaj in front of Hiranyakashipu, if you recall. And instead of Hiranyakashipu hearing glorification of himself, Prahlad Maharaj gave glorification of Krishna and he couldn't take it. It was too much for him already. So when that happened, you know, he became very upset. So our focus now in the next few minutes, now that we've got a brief history of how Prahlad Maharaj grew in devotional service and how Hiranyakashipu's envy for his son began growing and his anger began growing, he forced the two sons of Sukracharya and gave them one more chance to reform Prahlad Maharaj. And so they tried very hard. But at the end of the day, when they left, all the sons of the demons, they appreciated the instructions of Prahlad Maharaj. And Bhagavatam 7th canto, 8th chapter. Now we're going to concentrate on the 7th canto, 8th chapter of Bhagavatam. Because that is a chapter entitled, Lord Nasingadev slays Hiranyakashipu. And I think it's apt because today is the appearance day of Lord Nasingadev. So we should concentrate on this particular chapter because this is when he appeared. So in the chapter, it is stated actually that when the sons of the demons heard Prahlad Maharaj, what did they do? They took this matter very seriously. They rejected the materialistic instructions given to them by Shanda and Amarka. Very important. When these two sons of Sukracharya realized, oh my God, even the sons of the demons were becoming advanced in Krishna consciousness. Why? Because of Sadhu Sangha of Prahlad Maharaj, what happened to them? Instead of becoming happy, they became afraid. Why? Because they were under the shelter of Hiranyakashipu. So they approached the king of the demons and they described to him the situation. When Hiranyakashipu understood the entire situation, <clears throat> Bhagavatam tells us, he became extremely angry. In fact, he became so angry that his body trembled with anger. You know, I don't know how sometimes, hopefully we are not that angry. But when we become angry, Bhagavatam says, at the height of anger, our body trembles. So Hiranyakashipu's body trembled. And at that point, he decided that he wanted to kill Prahlad Maharaj. This is a very important point. That's the point when he decided let me kill Prahlad. Can you imagine how much heartless uh, and angry Hiranyakashipu was that his little boy, he should decide to kill? So what did he do? By nature, Bhagavatam said he was very cruel. And the moment he became insulted, 
he became hissing like a snake, which is trampled upon by someone's foot. Now, this is the description of uh, Hiranyakashipu that we find in Bhagavatam. It is found in 7, 8, 3, and 4, verses 3 and 4. So in verses 3 and 4, Bhagavatam tells us that Hiranyakashipu, because of his cruelty and because he felt very insulted, he became like a snake. So this is something very important for us. Devotees should be very careful not to feel insulted. Because if we are really not envious of others, and if we are truly trying to cultivate humility, then we should not feel, you know, and be sensitive that others are trying to insult us. Or someone has said something and it is beneath me. And how can he speak like that about me? This tendency to feel insulted is actually a subtle, uh, un it's a subtle manifestation, the root cause of which is actually envy. A true Vaishnava never feels insulted because a true Vaishnava is genuinely humble. Even if there's some doubt about something, we speak with a devotee. We may say, Prabhu, Mataji, you know, you said this thing. I, I was a bit disturbed. I wanted to understand, you know, um, did I offend you in any way? Uh, was what I said misunderstood? That is Vaishnava relationship. But demonic relationship is that immediately upon feeling insulted, we actually condemn the other personality. And that's what Hiranyakashipu did. Why? Because his mood was he was envious. But if you read 3 and 4 of the 8th chapter, you find that Bhagavatam tells us what were the three beautiful qualities of Prahlad Maharaj. When Prahlad Maharaj was faced with the envious nature and the angry nature of his father, how did he respond? This is very important. Bhagavatam tells us Prahlad Maharaj's nature was he was peaceful, he was mild, and he was gentle. He was peaceful, he was mild, and he was gentle. Why was he peaceful? He was peaceful because he had full, full faith in Krishna. And because he knew that whatever happens is the hand of Krishna. So he was peaceful. Why was he mild? He was mild because he knew that nothing was in his hands. And because he knew that nothing in his, was in his hands, he was not trying very hard through his own efforts to try and counteract the demon Hiranyakashipu. So he was not rude to his father at all. You will find that in this last chapter, however angry and, and, and irritated and envious Hiranyakashipu was, whatever words of insult he used on Prahlad Maharaj, Prahlad Maharaj never spoke to him out of envy. So when we counteract envy with envy, what is the difference between the demon and us? No difference. We have just become demons ourselves. But Prahlad Maharaj counteracted the envious nature of Hiranyakashipu by being peaceful, by being mild, and by being gentle. And why was he peaceful, mild? And how is it when you're peaceful and mild, then your disposition is gentle? You cannot artificially be gentle if you're not mild. My Guru Maharaj said to be mild Devki means don't take things very seriously. He used to say this point. If there are some differences between devotees, don't take it seriously. And if you read some of the letters that Prabhupada wrote to his disciples when they had differences, he would write there, matters between Vaishnavas should not be taken very seriously. Differences between Vaishnavas also should not be taken very seriously. Meaning to say, don't become insulted. This is how we become gentle. We should see the hand of Krishna. Why was Prahlad Maharaj able to be peaceful, mild, and gentle? In the next line, it is stated very nicely. Because his senses were under control. That is why it is so important to control our senses. But Bhagavatam tells us we cannot artificially control senses. Senses become automatically controlled when we perform unflinching devotional service at the lotus feet of Krishna. And so he stood before Hiranyakashipu with folded hands. He didn't stand like this, like he was going to fight. No, he stood before his father with folded hands. And Bhagavatam says, according to Prahlad's age, he was only five, six, or maybe seven. And according to his behavior as a boy, he was not to be chastised. He wasn't to be chastised at all. And yet, with staring, crooked eyes, Hiranyakashipu rebuked him. He rebuked him. 
Now, this purport of 7, 8, 3, and 4 is very important because uh, very nicely Prabhupada writes there, this was the start of the end of Hiranyakashipu. This was the start of the end. This was the time when Narsingadev was ready to come out. Why? Because the moment a devotee of the Lord is offended, insulted, the devotee will take it because he's peaceful, mild, and gentle. But when the Lord sees the devotee in danger and distress, the Lord cannot take it. And the Lord will never feel insulted if words of insult are hurled at him. But he will never withstand if someone is in the position to cause harm to his devotee. And one important point we should remember, Prabhupada makes a specific reference to the 10th canto, 4th chapter, 46th verse. 10, 4, 46. He says, what happens to one who is ready to perform harm to a devotee? And harm not only means you actually try to hurt a devotee. With your words, you can hurt a devotee. Even in our heart, if we don't mean well for a devotee, we're actually hurting a devotee. And what, what, what does that verse say? Ayuhu shriyam yasho dharmam, lokan ashisha evacha, hanti shreyamsi sarvani, pumso mahat atikramaha. The meaning is important. When one mistreats good souls, good souls, his lifespan, opulence, reputation, religion, possessions, and good fortunes are all destroyed. His lifespan, opulence, reputation, religion, possessions, and good fortune, all destroyed. And it is stated so nicely that the position of master is only one. It is Krishna. And the moment Hiranyakashipu decided, I want to kill Prahlad, that time his lifespan was actually finished. At that time, all the opulence he had would be wiped out. At that time, his reputation as a powerful person will become torn to shreds by Narsingadev. At that time, whatever religious principles he may have had, it was also wiped out. Whatever possessions and good fortune that he thought he had all this time was also gone. Why? Because he had insulted and threatened to harm Prahlad Maharaj. The same verse can apply to Ravana, can apply to Kamsa, can apply to Sishupal. If we are not careful, it can apply to us also. So we have to be very careful. And so Hiranyakashipu said, O oh, most impudent and most unintelligent disruptor of the family, O oh, lowest of mankind, you have violated my power to rule you, and therefore you are an obstinate fool. Today, I shall send you to the palace of Yamaraj. And then he said, Do you know, Prahlad, that in front of me, when I'm angry, all the three worlds, they tremble. Even the chief rulers are afraid of me. By whose power, you rascal, have you become so rude and impudent that you dare to appear fearless and you dare to overstep my power to rule you? And then Prahlad Maharaj famously says in text 7, My dear king, he doesn't even say father, he addresses Hiranyakashipu in a formal manner, my dear king. The source of my strength for which you are asking is also the source of yours. Indeed, the original source of all kinds of strength is one. He is not only your strength, but he is also mine. And he is also the strength for everyone. Without him, one cannot get any strength. Whether you are moving or not moving, whether you are superior or inferior, whether you are anyone, including Lord Brahma, everyone is controlled by the strength of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Such a nice point he actually said. And then he turns to his father and says, My dear father, please give up your demonic mentality. Do not discriminate in your heart between enemies and friends. Make your mind equipoise toward everyone, except for the uncontrolled and misguided mind. There is no enemy within this world. To me personally, this is the crux of the advice that Prahlad Maharaj is giving us today. His advice to Hiranyakashipu is an advice to all of us. 
The reason why we become disturbed and demonic in our heart is because we discriminate between enemies and friends. Hiranyakashipu's whole problem was he thought I am the only friend to myself and the rest of the world is the enemy. And anyone who refused to be under him is on the other side. But Prahlad Maharaj is telling him very nicely that there is only one enemy to us all and that enemy is an uncontrolled and misguided mind. No one is our enemy actually. Such a nice point. Nobody is our enemy. So actually I remember that my Guru Maharaj said that Prahlad Maharaj, when he turned to his father and told him, don't discriminate in your heart between enemies and friends, he was sending a message to Hiranyakashipu. And what was that message? It was the message that actually there should be unity in this world, even if there is diversity amongst us. I think it's a very important point for us to remember. There should be unity in this world, even if there is diversity among us. And the moment we cannot accept and celebrate diversity, we come in the category of Hiranyakashipu. We are no longer peaceful, mild and gentle. We find fault with others because we think they are our enemies. We don't realize that our mood should be friendly to everyone. When you have time, look at the seventh canto, fifth chapter, no, fifth chapter. Uh, there is a paragraph in the purport. And I want to read to you the paragraph, very important paragraph. Uh, Prabhupada says this point, everyone should be friendly for the service of the Lord. Everyone should praise another service to the Lord and not be proud of his own service. This is the way of Vaishnava thinking. And then Prabhupada writes, Vaikuntha thinking. There may be rivalries and apparent competition between servants in performing service. But in the Vaikuntha planets, the service of another servant is appreciated, not condemned. This is Vaikuntha competition. There is no question of enmity between servants. Everyone should be allowed to render service to the Lord according to his ability. And Prabhupada says so nicely that Krishna is the one who directs every living entity in their hearts according to their mentality to perform a service. And Prahlad Maharaj is saying the same point now to Hiranyakashipu. He's telling him, my dear father, there are only six enemies that steal away our wealth. Not Lord Vishnu. There are six enemies that steal away our wealth. And what are the six enemies? Kama, Kroda, Mother, Moha, Bhaya, Matsarya. Lust, anger, greed, madness, illusion, and envy. So now we come back huh, to what Prahlad Maharaj is telling his father in 7, 8, 10 of Sriman Bhagavatam. He says, my dear father, in former times, there were many fools like you who tried to conquer the world. But actually, they were very proud. They were thinking, I've conquered all the enemies in all 10 directions. But actually, they had not conquered these six enemies, which are where? Which are found in the uncontrolled, misguided mind. So actually, Prahlad Maharaj was requesting Hiranyakashipu, whatever disturbance that you have, it's not caused by Vishnu. It is caused by your own heart. It is caused by your own envy. Look inside, my dear father. It is your mind which is misguided and uncontrolled that is finding fault with another person. It is your mind that is discriminating and saying this person is my enemy and that person is my friend. Because Bhagavatam also says, today's enemy becomes tomorrow's friend. And tomorrow's friend becomes another day's enemy. So what is the value of seeing people as friends and enemies? This is demonic tendency. So Prahlad Maharaj said, if you conquer lust, anger, greed, madness, illusion, and envy, then my dear father, you will be very peaceful. And he says very nicely at the end, if a person is victorious over these six enemies, my dear father, and that person is equipoised to all living entities, then for him there are no enemies. 
And he says, enemies are merely imagined by one in ignorance. Such a nice point, Prabhu Sarmatajis. I think, you know, personally for me, this is the big takeaway from Narsingadev's appearance. Narsingadev is telling us through Prahlad Maharaj that the moment we see this world in duality, even when we see our devotee community in duality, we become disturbed. And in fact, enemies are not there. Very often the enemies are the mind. And if we become peaceful, mild and gentle, and if we learn to see the hand of Krishna in every junction, then we are not disturbed. We don't condemn this person and blame that person. That time that we used to spend time blaming and fighting, we can just learn one more shloka. And we can plunge ourselves in the study of Bhagavatam and be so peaceful. But did Hiranyakashipu listen to Prahlad Maharaj? No. Do we listen to Prahlad Maharaj? I hope so. And what did he say? He said, you rascal, you are trying to minimize my value. And you think you're better than me at controlling senses? You see, this is the problem with demons. Demons always compare. Oh, you think you're better than me? Devotees don't think that way. Devotees say you are better than me. That's why they're peaceful. And then Hiranyakashipu then said, from how you're speaking, I know now that you have a desire to die at my hands. Why? Because this kind of nonsensical talk is indulged by those who are about to die. <laughs> Actually, sometimes Hiranyakashipu speaks in a very comical way because he didn't realize, you know, that he was going to die. And now he says an important point. He says, most unfortunate Prahlad. Actually, who was fortunate? It was Prahlad. Hiranyakashipu was the most unfortunate one. He said, you have described this supreme being to me. Tell me who is this being? Is he so supreme that he is above everything? If he's all pervading like you say, where is he? If he is everywhere as you've said, why is he not present before me in this pillar? And this is the point where Hiranyakashipu looks at the pillar and says, is he present before me in this pillar? And then he says, because you're speaking so much nonsense, I shall sever your head from your body. Now let me see what your most worshipable God, whether he will come to protect you. I want to see it. And being obsessed with anger, Hiranyakashipu then chastised his devotee son Prahlad. He took up his sword. He got down from his royal throne. And with great anger, what did he do? He used his fist and he punched the column of the pillar. And that was the signal for the Lord. And the Lord from the pillar, Bhagavatam tells us, you know, the beauty of Krishna is that whenever Krishna comes, you know, there's always a reception for Krishna. When Krishna came as Mahaprabhu, it was the holy name. And now before he came from the pillar, a great fearsome sound erupted. And the sound was, was, the sound was so loud, Bhagavatam says, that it sounded like a crack that was actually covering the entire universe. As if there was a crack that was breaking the universe. And at that point of time, even the devatas and Lord Brahma heard the sound. And they thought, oh, our planets are being destroyed. Hiranyakashipu also heard that sound. And when he heard that sound, Bhagavatam says, for the first time in his life, he was afraid. He was actually afraid. This is in text 16. That's the first time Hiranyakashipu became afraid. And then he had never heard such a sound. The other leaders of the demons also became afraid. None of them could find the origin of this sound. And now to prove that the statement that Prahlad Maharaj made, that Krishna is everywhere, was not a joke and it was real and substantial, Lord Nasingadev came. He proved to everyone that he is present everywhere everywhere, inside and outside of us, even within the pillar of an assembly hall. And he exhibited this most wonderful form of a lion that no one had seen before. Hiranyakashipu looked all around to find the source of that sound. But then he saw this wonderful form of the Lord, which he could not ascertain. Is it a man? Is it a lion? And he was asking himself, what is this creature that is half man, half lion? And again, for the first time, we find that Hiranyakashipu was amazed. 
And now Hiranyakashipu studied the form of the Lord. He studied the form. And it's so nice, you know. Bhagavatam tells us how wonderfully, graphically, how Lord Nasingadev looked actually. The Lord's form was extremely fearsome. Why? Because he had angry eyes. And the eyes resembled molten gold. He had a shining mane, Bhagavatam tells us. And it expanded di the dimensions of his fearsome face. His teeth were very deadly, Bhagavatam says. And even his tongue was razor sharp. And it was moving in his mouth like a dueling sword. So powerful. His ears, you know, like an animal, they were erect and they were not moving at all. And Bhagavatam says his mouth was gaping and so were his nostrils. And they appeared like deep caves in the mountain. His jaws were parted in a very fearsome manner. And his entire body was so big that he touched the sky. Like an animal, you know, his neck was very short and very thick. And Bhagavatam says his chest was very broad but his waist was very thin. The hairs on his hair were as white as the rays of a moon. He had white hair on his body. And his arms, Bhagavatam said, were so powerful, they resembled flanks of powerful soldiers. And his arms spread out in all directions as he killed anything that was in his way. Hiranyakashipu then murmured to himself, not loudly, yeah? to himself. This was to give himself encouragement. Lord Vishnu possesses great mystical powers, I understand. But what is the use of such attempts? Who can fight with me? Even at the point when he saw the power of Narsingadev, he refused to bow. This was the sad, sad state of Hiranyakashipu. And he thought, let me attack him. And Bhagavatam said, just like the Lord is a lion, Hiranyakashipu was de declared to be an elephant. So like an elephant, you know, he came up and he started fighting Hiran, uh, he started fighting Narsingadev. Bhagavatam says, just like a small insect falls forcefully into fire and that, that insect, you know, becomes invisible in fire. Hiranyakashipu looked very powerful in front of everybody in the three universes, but in front of Krishna, Lord Narsingadev and his effulgence, he became almost invisible. Why? Because Krishna was situated as Lord Nasingadev in full, pure goodness. That is why he's so powerful. So Bhagavatam says now, Hiranyakashipu took his club and he began to beat Nasingadev. Nasingadev just captured the great demon. And along with the club that he captured, what did he do? He just began toying with Hiranyakashipu. Just like Garuda will capture a great snake and he toys with him. But Hiranyakashipu, you know, tried to struggle. And at that point of time, what did Narsingadev do? He gave him a chance to slip out. This is a very nice point. Uh, in Bhagavatam, uh, Narada Muni is explaining this to Yudhishthira Maharaj, you know. And he tells him, oh Yudhishthira, when Narsingadev gave Hiranyakashipu a slip, a chance to get out of the grip, it is like how Garuda would play with a snake and then he would just slip from his mouth. You may have seen sometimes, you know, cats, before they kill the mouse, they just play with the mouse. It looks like the mouse is going to run and for a while there appears to be hope. But then eventually the cat always catches the mouth. So in that way, when Hiranyakashipu appeared to slip out of the hands of Narsingadev, all the devatas became very afraid. Bhagavatam, uh, Bhagavatam tells us they thought oh, he's going to escape because if he escapes, what happens? He may kill, Hiran, he may kill Lord Nasingadev. So actually they were perturbed. When Hiranyakashipu became free from the hands of Nasingadev, he thought falsely that, ah, Nasingadev is afraid of my prowess. So what did Hiranyakashipu do? He took a little rest from the fight. Now he took up his sword, no more club. Huh? He took up his sword. He took his shield and now he went back to attack the Lord with great force. Bhagavatam says, when Lord Nasingadev saw Hiranyakashipu coming with his sword and his shield, and he was trying to keep no gaps between the sword and the shield, that's the mark of a great warrior. But how did Nasingadev react to that? Bhagavatam says he made a loud, shrill sound of laughter. It sounds very scary, actually. A very loud, shrill sound of laughter. And what did he do? 
He just waited for Hiranyakashipu to come. Bhagavatam says Hiranyakashipu came like a speed of a hawk. And he moved sometimes in the sky, sometimes on the earth, but his eyes were closed in fear of Nasingadev's laughter. So even though Hiranyakashipu made a show of power, Bhagavatam tells us in that one line, he was actually very fearful now. Very fearful. Because Lord Nasingadev is the supreme personality of Godhead. Either one follows him and submits to him. And when you submit to him, he protects you. But when you do not want to submit to him, then you must surrender to him with your life. Why? Because the force of the external energy of material nature is then working and supervising you. And that is why we become afraid. Hiranyakashipu thought he was so powerful, but he didn't realize he was under the material energy of Krishna. And that is why there was fear in his heart. Just like a snake captures a mouse, and just like Garuda captures a very venomous snake, Lord Narsingadev finally captured Hiranyakashipu. Hiranyakashipu was so powerful that even the thunderbolt of Indra could not pierce him. But he was captured very closely by Lord Narsingadev. And what did Lord Narsingadev do? Lord Narsingadev placed the demon on his lap supported him on his thighs. He sat down in the doorway of the assembly hall, neither inside nor outside. He put him on his lap, neither on earth nor in the sky. He was a half lion, a creature that was neither here nor there. He was not a creation of Lord Brahma because he is the one who created Lord Brahma. And then he used his powerful nails. Nails. He just put the demon on his lap and he tore Hiranyakashipu to with the nails of his hands. And your nails are not weapons. In fact, nails fall into a very unusual category. But they are definitely not weapons. And Bhagavatam says, when Lord Nasinga, they've tore open the body of Hiranyakashipu, his mouth and his mane were sprinkled with the drops of the demon's blood. His eyes were fierce and nobody could even look at Lord Nasingadev. He licked the edge of his mouth with his tongue and Lord Nasingadev then took out the garland of intestine, stomach of Hiranyakashipu, the abdomen. And when he took that out, he put it on himself. This is a very important point. Because it shows how powerful Nasingadev is, that he could just take something so powerful of Hiranyakashipu and merely put it on him as a decorative piece. If you go to Ahovalam, you know, which is a beautiful place in Shetra for Lord Nasingadev, you will see right at the top, before you reach the Stamba, there's a beautiful Ugra Nasingha. And there you will see that the same the Lord, you know, with the garland of the Testing of Hiranyakashipu is there. And a priest actually explained to us very nicely this point. He said that the Lord did not allow the intestines of Hiranyakashipu to drop on the floor, but he put them on his neck because Hiranyakashipu had a lot of Vedic knowledge. That's why when Hiranyaksha actually was killed, Hiranyakashipu pacified his mother on the strength of Vedic knowledge. He wanted to show the world that the importance of Vedic knowledge should never be underestimated. But more important than that is that Vedic knowledge must always be connected to Krishna. Vedic knowledge must always touch the lotus body of Krishna. Then it becomes practiced and revealed knowledge. Otherwise, like Hiranyakashipu, it just remains in his abdomen. It had no value. So this is a very important point. And just like a lion killed the elephant, Hiranyakashipu was killed by Lord Nasingadev. And Bhagavatam tells us Nasingadev was still so powerful and angry that even when thousands of soldiers of Hiranyakashipu came, he just killed every one of them just with the ends of his nails. My nails are short, but if you have long nails, just the end of the nail, you know, that's where he touched them and they were all killed. The hair on Lord Nasingadev's head shook the clouds. 
His eye stole the effulgence of the suns and the luminaries in the sky. His breathing agitated the seas and the oceans. And because of his roaring, even the elephants in the world began to cry in fear. The Lord was so transcendently angry that the airplanes in the outer space were still shaking. And because of the pressure of the Lord's lotus feet where he was seated, the earth appeared to slip. All the hills and the mountains sprang up because of the force of the Lord's lotus feet. And the sky and the body, all directions became dark and only illumination came from Lord Nasimhadev. And at that point of time, Bhagavatam tells us, all the devatas approach Lord Brahma, ask Nasimhadev to calm down. And Brahmaji approached Lakshmiji. And Lakshmiji said, no, even I can't do it. And they all approached Prahlad Maharaj, the little boy who was standing there watching everything, who was peaceful, mild, and gentle. And they said, you please approach Lord Nasimhadev. And then Prahlad Maharaj approached Lord Nasimhadev sang to him beautiful prayers from the seventh canto, ninth chapter, very beautiful prayers. And at the end of the prayers, Lord Nasimha Dev becomes very pacified. This is the beautiful pastime of the Lord. Just by hearing how the Lord destroyed the personification of materialistic desire, Hiranyakashipu, we also pray that Krishna destroys all materialistic desire and envy and non-respect that we have for living entities. And we pray that Lord Nasingadev replaces that with respect for all living entities. We pray that Lord Nasingadev removes that most difficult envy in our hearts that destroys and disrupts our service, that destroys our relationships between Vaishnavas. We pray that Lord Nasingadev will stop in us this idea of duality of this material world, that we see someone as an enemy and when we see someone as a friend. And we try to remember Prahlad Maharaj, who was peaceful with everyone, who was mild and gentle because his senses were controlled. Why? Because his senses were always at the lotus feet of the Lord. And Prahlad Maharaj's prayer is a very beautiful prayer we should end today's time with. In the fifth canto, 18th chapter, we started today's class with the prayer from the eighth verse. Let's end today's class by the prayer from the ninth verse in the fifth canto, 18th chapter. Swastiya stu vishwasya kala prasidatam dhyayantu bhutani shivam mitodhya manas chabadram bhajatadaduk saji aveshyatam no matirapi hahai tuki. Prahlad Maharaj is praying, may there be good fortune throughout the universe. May all envious persons be pacified. May all living entities become calm by practicing bhakti yoga. For by accepting devotional service, they will think of each other's welfare. Therefore, let us all engage in the service of the Supreme Transcendence Lord Sri Krishna and always remain absorbed in thought of him. One very important point here is, if we accept devotional service truly, the symptom of our accepting and practicing devotional service is that we will always think of others' welfare. We will not think of our welfare. Our welfare is always taken care of by Krishna. Why should we worry? But we will always think of others' welfare. That is why in one of the verses here, Hiranyakashipu is described as Shri Hiranyakashipu. Shri Hiranyakashipu. The word Shri is only used for Krishna or devotees. And Prabhupada states in that purport why the word Shri is used. The word Shri is used because Hiranyakashipu had a well-wisher and his well-wisher was Prahlad Maharaj. And because of the association of Hiranyakashipu with his glorious son, Hiranyakashipu is glorified with the word Shri. If we take the association of great devotees, then their protection on us will always be there. And if we pray to accept devotional service in such a way that we always think of others' welfare, then that brings us peace, that brings us gentleness, and that brings us the mildness of nature. Jaya Granthara Srimad Bhagavatam Ki 
जय ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भगवत गीता की जय श्री नरसिंह देव भगवान की जय श्री प्रनाथ महाराज की तथा गौर प्रेमन मिनियापलिस यात्रा की